Kyla and Douglas Gabriel here, and our lesson is on the nature of reality. We have a video attached in the description box, and I, my apologies if you're looking at this video and there is no description box because it's embedded in someone's uh, page. Hopefully they'll grab the link. But if you go to the link, there is a video. It's called The Nature of Reality, and we asked our listeners and viewers to first look at that before Douglas going into a deep dive of the subject material. Why this particular subject is of interest to us, and we thought of our audience, is that Douglas has written a book. It's called The Theory of Everything, and that is also attached. We also offer it as a free PDF uh, link so that you can get that book right now. This all ties together, but we needed a bridge. And so I asked Douglas to come today and talk about the video that we've all just seen and show us how his book will take us even further into understanding the nature of reality. Douglas, welcome. Thank you. I was so glad that Betsy put that movie up. It was the second time that she put that video up on the Cat Report and before previously on um, Aim for Truth, Truth News Headlines. And I think the first time I watched it into maybe a little part of it and I didn't really watch the rest of it. This time I watched the whole thing. I was so excited because basically the book that I um, recently released not long ago called The Ethers, uh, A Theory of Everything, Sounds kind of like a crazy title because, you know, who's going to come up with theory of, uh, a new theory of everything? Well, you know that there are dozens of new theories of everything. The theory of everything at TOE, they call them, is basically the new standard. If you cannot show how everything connects together in terms of astrophysics, in terms of atomic structure, then they're not going to listen to your theory. So she is putting forth the theory of, uh, well, basically, uh, the quantum reality is what they call it, taking... Uh, relativistic theories of Einstein and adding quantum theory to it. But as she points out in this beautiful little video, no one's been able to do anything with quantum theory and string theory doesn't work. And so what they put forth in this is an eight dimensional universe. But the way that it's done coincides with what we found out when we were doing the research on the ethers. Now the ethers, what, what are the ethers? They go all the way back to the beginning of writing. When um, the ancient Hindus were writing about the ethers, they said there were seven of them. But they said that they were basically more or less the manifestation of beings. And this is where modern science cannot take a leap. They cannot take the leap of understanding that behind everything that they're experiencing, we are seeing the shadow of beings. We are and without beingness, without there being intelligent design to the universe, and if there's intelligent design to the universe, it can't just be random consciousness. It can't just be, you know, what was it that caused that intelligence? So whether you call the intelligence itself the consciousness and that that's a being, that's where the real debate gets going thick because they don't want to accept the past theories. Now, the past theories... Literally, this, these go back to 10,000 BC in some cases in the way that we look at it. And so what they're saying in the Upanishads and what they're saying in the writings of Manu from the ancient Hindu is that these seven brothers are all gay, are all controlled by their mother and that we only get to see four of them down here. We call them earth, the, the states of matter, which the Greeks would call earth, um, water, air, and fire. Well, there's another one called the Akasha, according to the ancient Hindus, and that one goes in between the four. And so those are the five we can see now, but there's two more in the future. Well, in this video, they break the universe down into seven elements, and they say that this new quantum reality theory, and mind you, there hasn't been a theory in modern science or even in science per se, that has lasted more than 100 years. Theories are transplanted all the time by new theories. So let me give you what she says, and you'll recognize these. And when you're saying she, you're talking about the narrator of the video. Yes, I don't yes. know her name. Yeah. So the lovely narrator of the video on the eight-dimension crystal. The eight-dimensional crystal. 
And when I heard this at first, I, uh, the first time I thought, oh, just another theory, just another theory. And then I saw her working with certain substances and certain ideas. And I'm thinking, oh my, 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 she's getting very, very close. So I paid close attention. And now I've taken what they have given in this new quantum reality theory as presented by this lovely lady in the video and put it into a sensible order that directly coincides with the theories of the past and modern theories and with the theories of Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy. One of the great scientists of all times, he founded the Galactic Center, Super Galactic Center, and demonstrated that the center of mass is not on the sun in our solar system, but is a dynamic point in between the sun and the inner planets and the outer planets. He also demonstrated that light in a continuum is not limited by a speed. She says in this video, the speed of light is, is contested. Yes, that's because new lasers have accelerated light to a thousand times the speed of light. And so now they don't know what to do. There is no standard. And why was the standard there to begin with? I pointed this out many times when I've spoken about ethers. In the Einsteinian theories of relativity, it, it is a, a, a priori assumption that the luminiferous ether exists. Luminiferous. The illuminating. The ether that carries light. And he says this point blank. Everyone ignores it except new theorists who are now looking into ethers. Most of the new theories, which we, you will find in this new book, which is under my name, Douglas Gabriel, The Ethers. Uh, it's included in the link. And it's included in the link. You will find these new theories in the back in an appendix so that you can cogitate them, so that you can work with them and see what you think. Because you know what? Your idea may be just as good or better than anybody else's. But what I did is I went back to the original sources, the most ancient sources I could, and brought it all the way up to modern times and demonstrate there is a golden thread that runs through all of it, and that's that there are seven ethers. And these seven ethers are found basically in everything. And they are found in what you'd call the seven major planets of the solar system, the seven colors in the rainbow, the seven... Um, uh, uh, notes in our octave that we use. The everything is seven, whether it be uh, animal uh, phylos or whether it be anything. It doesn't matter. Minerals, it, uh, mathematics, it all goes back to seven. If there is a system, it is based upon seven. Why? Because in our solar system, we are influenced by the seven major planets, including the sun, and. We, and you can transplant sun and earth, sun and earth, whatever you, however you want. But there's a sun in seven planets. And these seven planets relate to the seven organs in your body. There are seven major organs. There are seven major systems in your body. When science discovers this in the future, and the seven, the beauty of the seven is that the fifth, sixth, and seventh part of the seven system is sometimes hidden, isn't here yet. It's the future. But it's implicit in the system. And you can read the future by knowing that the system of seven is a consistent system that follows certain patterns. And so when they point out that basically this is an eight-dimensional quantum reality theory, there are really seven dimensions. And when you return to where you started from, it's the octave, it's the eighth. So she lists them, and the theory, uh, basically the theory lists them as, first off, information. And that's interesting. You know, when they, they debate both sides of, you know, what is information? You know, is it consciousness or so on and so forth, back and forth? Well, let's just list these the way that they give them. Information is one dimension. What they are calling causality loops, what I would call a continuum, but they call them causality loops, which, you know, in science, these are pretty well recognized and de long debated elements of science that no one has really come to absolute conclusions on any of these. The third one is non-determinism. And, you know, the, the double slit experiment demonstrates that. And now quantum entanglement demonstrates that if you don't have an observer, nothing is determined. As a matter of fact, there may be no perception. <laughs> it is all dependent upon the observer. And the observer affects what it is that's being observed. This is the concepts that are out there in science now. And then consciousness, that's the next, that's the fourth step, consciousness. 
And then they want to break consciousness down into the smallest units, so they go into pixel, pixels or pixelation. And the smallest unit uh, that they can possibly contrive, uh, and they believe that that's how you get to the real core of going up the dimensions. And then they believe that the golden ratio is the key. And the golden ratio, if you don't know what that is, it's basically found in everything. It is a ratio that determines the distances of the planets from each other. If you measure them and you look at it, it's the same exact ratio as in the musical scale, as in the ratio of the golden mean and the golden ratio found in your body, in your hand, in your arm, in your relationship of your head to your body. Everything that is perfect in nature, whether it be a nautilus shell, a tiny, teensy, tiny shell, or a galaxy, it's the same exact ratios. It's called the golden ratio. And they've come upon this and they believe that, that, that this is one of the key factors to raising yourself up from the third and fourth dimension, and time is, according to them, the fourth dimension, into the, into the dimension of the eighth dimension. Now, they don't say this, but I'm going to say it. When you reach the end, you reach this, uh, what they call the eighth dimension crystal, eighth dimension crystal. Okay, and then they come up with some really fancy stuff. And this is the fancy footwork I'm going to try to make very, very simple for you because we already put it in the book. And we know that it's true because this has been taught for 10,000 years, 12,000 years. And it can be seen in anything you want to apply it to. And it almost never fails whether you're looking at the development of a monarch butterfly or the chambers of the brain or the chambers of the heart and the new chambers of the heart that will arise the aeolums that are on top of each of the chambers. And the fifth chamber around the heart has now been discovered. And so we thought there were four chambers. There's five, but there's really seven. We think that there's five ventricles in the brain, but there's six, and then there's a seventh that will reopen again. So in the, we have to see that some of these things, as she points out, she wants to bring it all back, and the scientists want to bring it all back to shapes, geometry, mathematics, because that's what they can understand. But what they don't understand is that everything that they're examining is only is, is completely limited by their earthbound perception. In other words... That the, is, you can't perceive a higher dimension using the tools of the lower dimension. Precisely. And, and I want to go back before you get too far on these how they've broken down this, because when I listen to that video... I know that there's information out there. This is what we were faced with a few years ago when we started our, our little uh, YouTube is because we saw that people were getting information, but it's just information. It's just everywhere and it's just overloaded. But we said if we, what we have to do is bring people up to a higher level. So let's organize the pertinent information into what we call intelligence. So when we lay this out for you, you know, each day, this information we collect, we're letting you know and telling you the story of the day from the information we receive. We try to give it to you at a higher level so you can understand what's going on on the ground. Well, then the next thing that we lead you to really is this non-determinism. That is, what is the world but your perception of the world? And if we want to change the world, let's work on a higher plane of changing it. And let's start working with our perception. Now, this is where the Tavistock and Cecil Rhodes got involved in the propaganda wars because they also knew this powerful concept in the universe. And so what they do with their propaganda is they try to fill our heads with the world the way they see it. And so if enough of us see the world that way, that's the world and that's the way it becomes. And so, yes, then that leads to the next step of consciousness. So really, if we want to win this war that it looks like we're fighting, if we really want to, we would work on the level of consciousness and perception. What say you? That's absolutely right. I couldn't have said it better. And it reminded me, as you were speaking, that Aristotle put this in his own system. And he called it um, the system of hierarchies. And he also, he, he said the first one was quantity. And that's information. Then there's quantity. That's causality loops. Then there's relationship. That's non-determinism. Then there is space. That is consciousness. Because when you parcel out time in space, consciousness arises. And then you go into the next realm, according to Aristotle, there's many different names for these, but you could call them time, motion, harmony, and suffering. We all started at suffering, we'll return to suffering, according to him. Suffering pervades all of them. These are called the hierarchies, according to Aristotle. 
what they have here is they mixed it and they mixed them up and they lack what you just pointed out the information is there but there isn't the consciousness yes without consciousness the information means nothing you need meaning and she points that out in the video but she doesn't make enough of it and it's very simple whether it's the greeks or whether it's the hindus or whoever you want to go into into the past they had the system laid out we just ignore it in this day and age no well we didn't ignore it because we also know it doesn't take a lot of people to change the consciousness the perception the reality of the world absolutely and that's what we're trying to do and especially with this book because you can read rudolf steiner all day long and never arrive at this uh, even if you read his book, The Fourth Dimension, Rudolf Steiner has a book called The Excellent Fourth Dimension. Mm -hmm. And it shows you this, and it shows you what a tesseract is. A tesseract is like the next step that a human can understand. It's a, it's a geometric solid that can't exist in the three-dimensional world because it moves and it's in time. Basically, it knows what it was, is, and will become. And this tesseract is like the next step we could become. That would be like the fifth stage here. That's what they would or call an pixel. Another way that people might understand it is having an experience that's outside of the dimension that you regularly interface with would be when you have these moments of synchronicity. When outside of time and space, that most perfect thing happens, where did that come from? That is the next dimension of, you, you just mentioned, the fifth yeah. dimension. Yeah. Or the fourth dimension of time. And then the fifth, sixth, and seventh are pouring in to the consciousness of the being who isn't limited by time and space. We go into this in great detail in the book, the ethers. And the ethers, each one of them, the ethers are warmth, light, sound, or, or magnetism of all sorts, not just electromagnetism, life. Now, the sun gives us warmth, light, a type of magnetism, and creates all life on Earth. And so light goes out from the sun, but it's Saturn that turns around and comes back as dark light. And this is well known. It's called the solar breath. And when it comes back and dark light meets direct light coming from the sun, a spheres are created. And that's why the planets are spheres. Forces from the outside being that where light goes to a certain limit and then it comes back on itself magnetically because it's being pressed in by the cosmos, by what we would call the stars. Or, And we're going to talk about this in a second because if you do not consider the whole cosmos, you're not getting the whole picture. And the whole cosmos works the same way that an atom works. It would have to be that way because it's a 3D holographic universe. And this is now known because they have six different ways to look at the universe and they've combined them all and then what they've come up with is this theory that I'm telling you which basically coincides with what Rudolf Steiner said. Rudolf Steiner said the shape of the cosmos is a dodecahedron an expanded kind of inflated dodecahedron and that the earth which they call a pixel because we're on the pixel level here they say the smallest thing that can be measured is a pixel and so they have basically broken the pixel down into believing that that's more or less the basic unit of matter, what they would we now call quanta, quantum, but they know quantum doesn't work and a quanta doesn't work because everything doesn't emanate. Some things don't emanate. Some things suck. A black hole sucks. So all of this theory is based upon what happens at the event horizon of a black hole and the dynamic heartbeat between an ion jet that comes out of the middle of a galaxy and the supermassive black hole that is found in the same place. And there's a pulsation that goes, just like with a tree. They now know trees have a heartbeat. Their heart beats twice a day. And the tree literally expands and contracts. And this is how they move water higher than a column of water can rise, according to scientists. They've never understood how does water get to the top of a tree? Because it has a heartbeat. It's beating and reaching to the cosmos, just like we are with our arms and the our limbs, when we say our limbs, our arms and legs, imagine every motion you can make going forward, backward, up and down with your arms and legs. That's what we are. We're like a tree, this globe of a tree that is the future. So the future comes in through our limbs if we listen. And that's what they're saying here, which I was so shocked to hear. Finally, they admit what the ancients have always known. The future is now. There is no time it is only because our consciousness parcels it out in pixels, in little pieces, 
And then we put those pieces together and we create and construct what we think is our own little universe. Each of us has our own universe and it's through our own observation. It is not the same. Some are in hell and some are in heaven standing next to each other. That's why I keep putting the pictures of Dante in our cat report because I want to remind people that all of these levels of consciousness are here with us. Uh, it's just that you don't see it physically. And when your consciousness changes, it changes those pixels to present a different world to you. But we have to also remember that these things have relative and absolute values. Okay? So when you're looking at the human point of view, that's relative. When you're looking at the cosmic point of view, that's the, uh, relative and cosmic. Uh, 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 absolute, excuse me. So when you look at the cosmic, it's the absolute. So we keep talking about the cosmic because you and the cosmos are one. The heartbeat of the cosmos is 7.84 frequencies, which is the same frequency of your heart, same frequency of the turning of the earth, the Schumann wave, the same frequency found that can penetrate anything, anywhere in the cosmos. So when we're talking about these things, they're not just geometric structures, they're not mathematical constructs. On the earth they are, but then you have to get fluid because you have to go into the future, and the future isn't bound by the third dimension of space. It is not bound by the dimension of time. So when we get to the last seventh stage that they have here, and they've missed a stage, but that's okay. They missed humanness, but that's all right. When they get to this uh, eight-dimensional crystal, that's the cosmos. And they say it's made up of, of billions of untold billion fractals of a tetrahedron. And that the tetrahedron... And if you don't know what that is, it is a three-sided solid, geometric platonic solid, it's called, a tetrahedron. So it's flat on the bottom and has three sides. So it's a pyramid with three sides instead of four. Well, guess what? Your pineal gland is that shape. Uh Uh-oh. And guess what's right below your pineal gland? The corpus quadrigemini, which is a cube, but not any normal cube. It's a cube that's been divided into eight cubes. Uh Uh-oh, are you you getting where I'm going with this? So when you're talking about the eight-sided or the eight-dimensional crystal, it is your corpus quadrigemini. And 11 of your 12 nerves run into the corpus quadrigemini and go into those different cubes because it's divided into eight cubes. So a cube is divided into eight cubes in your brain in the fourth ventricle. And on top of it sits your pineal gland and it's the shape of a tetrahedron, which they now have determined is the shape of the universe. The smallest shape of the universe is a tetrahedron. Well, hello, your pineal gland connects you to the universe. And how might that be described if one were to describe it biblically? Glad you mentioned that. Yes. Because in the head is the most perfected aspects of your being. It's the past. In your limbs are the part of you that's becoming, it's the future. And in your heart is the balance. So heaven is in your head. The most perfect organ you have is your reptilian brain, your your hind brain, your what's called the um, cerebral cerebellum. It's called the tree of life, according to some, because it's perfect. At its base, you have the waters of life. Flowing from the tree of life, you have waters flowing. So they flow from uh, the choroid plexus, which is at the base of the fifth ventricle, which which causes your brain to float. Your, your brain floats, it's an island. And this is an area of, in, your, in our bodies, where we evolve. But there are forces here on the planet that know that we are moving towards an evolution of what it is to be a human being, and they want to hold us back. So that is why we see the attacks on this area of our brain through the use of fluoride and aluminum and things like that that keeps us locked in so we won't be able to realize that full potential. Yes, absolutely. Because right there in your... I'm so glad you mentioned this, that paradise is in your brain. Yes, Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And the pineal gland, this tetrahedron, which they say is the pixel of the universe of the cosmos, and they prove it to you uh, in this new theory, mathematically. And I would say, Ritter Steiner said that Uh, The whole earth is a tetrahedron. Blow it up like a balloon and you will find along the edges of that tetrahedron the ring of fire. In other words, the volcanic areas of the earth as the earth is blown up and expanding along those lines are where it's volcanic. The ring of fire, another 
uh, well-known areas which are all volcanic. So he points out that, and he points out that the pineal gland is the tetrahedron. So we are the individual, the tetrahedron, which is a perfect copy of the universe, sitting on top of a perfect copy of the universe, the eight, what they're calling the eight-dimensional crystal. I call, I say, is the corpus quadrigemini. Now, why do I say that? Because we, what does the Bible say? It says we are singular in our eye, right? Well, the only nerve that doesn't run through the corpus quadrigemini is the optic nerve, and it runs directly to the pineal gland and strips the pineal gland of hormones called melatonin, which controls, it's the master gland of your whole body. It controls how big you are, how small you are. It even c controls your thyroid, even c okay. it controls everything. Which is ad adversely affected when you're looking at a blue screen all day. Let's just remind us of that. And being bombarded yes. by 5G. Yes. So that's another way that this area of your brain is being attacked by technology. Yes, and so the optic nerve comes and it stimulates the uh, and strips the inside of this tetrahedron, this pine cone, this pineal gland. And then as it strips it and it goes into the bloodstream, it controls your, pu when you have puberty, it controls everything, everything. You can't name anything. It controls your salt levels. It controls all your organs. It controls the seven organs. The seven organs are controlled by the pineal gland. Okay? So that's your singularness through the optic nerve. The other 11 nerves, which are through your whole body and your gut and everything, run to the eight-dimensional crystal, corpus quadrigemini. And they each branch off and go to different sections of it, and that's how we read everything we do, everything that, our will, the most mysterious part of us is our willpower. It's, it's not understood. Sometimes we can be superhuman, sometimes we can be, uh, we die because of depression. We don't understand our willpower. It can do anything. It's superhuman. And uh, the capacities are future capacities right here available for us if we could have the consciousness to understand them. Anyway, so sitting on top in your brain in the fifth ventricle and then in front of the fifth ventricle is the fourth ventricle which is basically the grail castle and I can go into a whole description there but let's just say that the, the crystals all your life you were depositing this is now known they thought this wasn't true even Aristotle thought this wasn't true when you die they cut open the pineal gland the amount of calcium carbonate crystals in your brain are directly equivalent to your IQ the amount of calcium phosphorate crystals are different and the amount of uh, calcium uh, uh, let's see calcium carbonate cal oh sorry calcium calcite calcium calcite calcium uh, phosphorus those are th the two ends of the spectrum of humanity one of them you're going to be evil and awful basically and the other one you're going to be angelic but you're know, useless and but in the in the middle if you can develop through your heart and through your bloodstream and then sending that up through your, what would be called your throat and your head up into this area, through and, your and, nerve and system. And you're motioning your hand up through your chakra area, up through your crown. Rudolf Steiner calls it a second spinal column that's in the front of your body. If you can actually stimulate that, you can deposit calcium carbonate crystals in your pineal gland, and that causes the pineal gland not only to open and to allow the uh, brain fluids to flow, but also allows piezoelectric charges to go into the fourth ventricle, shoot all the way in, all the way to the pituitary and cause excretions of pituitrin, which is the best thing for you that there practically is in the whole universe. And they call it the dew of heaven, the nectar of the gods, they call it soma, whatever, the, you know, a thousand names for well, it. We have a book we wrote about that, so I might include that, but let's go back to this, uh, the mystery of seven. Now, the reason I had to go there uh -huh. is because if you do not relate this stuff to the human body, then you are out to lunch. It must relate to the human body. Everything in the cosmos is in the human body, but one thing, comets. And they're in the human body when a, a, a woman is having a baby, because a woman having a baby is a gift from the past that is like a comet. Remember, comets come out of the Oort realm, a ring, which it mean they come out of nothingness, and then they incarnate, and they exist, and then they go back there, and then they excarnate, and they don't exist. That's just like a baby. And what do they do? Why is the tail of a comet point away from the sun when it gets close to the sun? You see, it is a 
extra solar being that comes in to clean up the solar system, just like children are coming into our world to clean it up to make it a better place. So anyway, the only thing not in the cosmos in the human body is a comet, but everything else is there. So no matter what they say, if they come up with a new theory, it better relate to the human body. So that's the reason I jumped off on that. But now let's break this down. They got it in the wrong order. Okay. Everybody should know this. It's very, very simple because Betsy loves to tell this story, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it anyway. Tyla, Betsy. She has many names. Uh, a zero dimension is a dot. You exist. Well, Science tells us nothing can exist that didn't exist before. That's a lie. There is creation out of nothingness, and that's proven by black holes and ion jets in every galaxy that they manifest, which is all of them, all galaxies as they're maturing go through the stages of supermassive black holes and ion jets. And I'll go there in a minute. But a dot means you come out of nothingness. Well, that's what God's doing with us. We are being created out of nothingness to be just like a god. That's what the cosmos is doing with us. You call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter. You can break it down into numbers and geometric forms. And at the end of this, I'm going to tell you the truth, which they have yet to get to. And if they would simply look in this direction, they'd find it instantaneously because that's what consciousness does. And consciousness has said this for 10,000 years, 12,000 years. So I'm just pointing out. I'm not so smart. I just did the research. So a dot is zero dimensions. A line is one dimension because it can go, you know, one direction or the other, but always in just that line. A plane, that's one dimension. Two dimensions is a plane. A plane is usually, they give the example of a shadow. Okay, so it doesn't have any depth to it, but it does have length and width. So it only exists in this bizarre realm that you can hardly imagine. Just like a line only exists in a bizarre realm that you can't hardly imagine. But they will tell you in mathematics that a line, once it goes out left and right, comes back to the line again. It's also for a plane, okay? And in a minute, I'll tell you what they talk about a dot, but, you know, a point of existence. But anyway, when you get to three dimensions, you have what a human being is in. You can go forward, you can go backwards, you can go left, right, up, and down. That's three dimensions. It's a cube, folks. And your consciousness is not in your head. It is in your heart. So when you go to do something, you can either go forward, backward, left, right, up, or down, or any dancing movement in between, as I pointed out. But the point is, you come back to the square, the cube, not the square, excuse me, the cube in the heart, and it can get really gigantic as the cosmos, and can get really small and hard as a rock, but the point is, that's where your consciousness resides. So you are, whether you like it or not, bound by a cube. So your consciousness is a cube in the three dimensions. But... When you take a cube and the number one thing that they use a cube, a tesseract, the example they give of a tesseract, the only one they can really imagine, <laughs> though others, no, that's not true. The easiest one to imagine is a cube. When you take a cube and you make it a tesseract, a being, I said being because it is, but a, a geometric form that is like none we imagine that is not bound by time and not bound by space, you have a tesseract, and they show a cube. And what is it doing? It's rotating and becoming different, but always the same and always changing and always beautiful. It's, it's glorious. Well, that's what we do all the time. Every time you think about the past and you have a memory, or you wonder about the future, you're a tesseract, because you're not bound by left, right, up, down, forward, backwards, because why? Your consciousness can make meaning of things over time. When your consciousness can make meaning of time, you are a fourth dimensional being. But let's just go to three dimensional. When you're three dimensional and you hold up your hand and the sun casts a shadow, you're making that shadow now, aren't you? So you as a 3D being can create infinite two dimensional realities that you, that are part of you. They are a subset of you. Okay? So what can we do about time? Can we cast a shadow into the future? Of course we can. We can look at our patterns in the past, and those are the same patterns that are going to transform and metamorphose into the future. Even if you're talking about a monarch butterfly, if you study the pattern long enough, you will see the pattern of seven in all seven stages of a monarch. Same thing with a human being. Now, when you go into the fourth dimension, you're really not a human anymore. You have consciousness that if you are lucky, you can get eternal with this consciousness. You can look at things down here in the three-dimensional world that are eternal. 
And you're gonna say, wait, nothing's eternal. First off, some of the lies of science. Space is infinite. No, it's not, it's finite. Light moves at a certain speed. No, it doesn't. In a continuum, it can move at infinite speeds. Uh, space is basically boundless. No, it's not. It's a geometric form, and we replicate it in ourselves. Uh, you cannot create anything out of nothing. That is incorrect. Creation out of nothing, this happens all the time. So you can't go in. Uh, love is an eternal thought. When you can look at love and see it, it is eternal. When you can look at mercy or grace or any of the higher virtues, you are talking about going into a spaceless realm where you're not just bound by basically entropy because the third dimension is ruled by entropy. It's ruled by the clock running down. But if you can see the spiritual beings who are casting their shadow in to make, into this world to make the third dimension, then you see eternal thoughts, okay? So when you're in the third dimension, you can reach into the fourth. And you can reach into the fifth and the sixth, and at the seventh in this one system, you're back to the beginning. But in the other system they're using, when you're back to seven, you're really at the eighth, you're at the eighth dimension. But that does not matter. The point is, you started as a dot, as perfect, and you will end as an expanded dot, as big as the cosmos, as big as you can conceive the cosmos to be. That's what you will be. A dot with higher consciousness. Yes. Because it's all about the elevation of consciousness. Yeah, so the dot, Ritter Steiner gives us the example. He says, if you want to understand the way it really is, look at a seed going through all of its stages. From you know, uh, from having uh, a stalk and, and leaves and and blossom and fruit and seed, and then the seed falls to the ground and dies, and through time arises again inexplicably. Nobody can explain a seed. Nobody. I don't care who you are. You cannot explain a few things in this world. A fire. You cannot explain what fire is. You cannot explain what oxygen is. You cannot explain what electricity is. You cannot. Sorry, you don't even have the concepts to describe what we're observing here in the outer world. We little zero-dimensional beings that started off as zero-dimensional little dots. If you take a dot, because, you know, if you take a pencil and you make a dot, what is it? It's a little circle, isn't it? Expand it out until it becomes a sphere. Now keep going because you're using the force of one dimension of a line going out, 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 out. That's the force of one dimension, a line. You're a zero-dimension, you're a dot. You come into one dimension, you start getting bigger, you become a sphere in all directions. Then you become a plane. And a plane is infinite, literally, in this case, because the spiritual world is infinite. Infinite amount of planes all touch the outer edge of a sphere at a dot, at a point, at a single point. Not at a line and not at a plane, but at a point. So when you have infinite amount of planes raying in towards that little dot that has been expanded into a sphere by the force of one dimension of drive in one direction, you basically have the image of the cosmos, don't you? You have, that's what the three-dimensional world is all about. The head is a sphere, the planets are spheres, the stars are spheres. Why? Because the sphere is the perfect shape, as I told you, when the ethers go out and come back and they meet each other, they create a sphere. Okay. Now, this arrangement, let me just say one more thing and then I'm going to go into why their arrangement is really pretty cool if they simply rearrange it and look at it the way the ancients would look at it. So in this video, the lady who presents it does a beautiful job, uh, but then she starts to get all wiggy on you. And she's going to tell you this. The whole universe is based upon one side of a tetrahedron, okay? And that the eight-dimensional crystal existed before everything, and we're all going back to the eight-dimensional crystal. And the way that that happens is just beautiful. The eight-dimensional crystal in their mind, in the quantum reality theory, says that they project the eight-dimensional crystal into a four-dimensional quasi-existence. And then they project that into a four-dimensional existence. And then they project that into a three-dimensional quasi-existence that we exist in. 
And in that world, the golden ratio rules and that the smallest little element is not an atom, it's a tetrahedron. Now, if that didn't confuse you, but in fact, they're actually correct, and I'm going to demonstrate that to you. They need to rearrange these. Their one dimension should be a pixel. And when it's transformed, the pixel becomes the eight-dimensional crystal. That's what's the intent to begin with. That's where the pixel came from. It's the mother giving birth to the child. And that's the first and the seventh dimension because in the way that it works, there's only three dimensions. And then as you destroy those dimensions, you create the fifth, fifth, sixth, and seventh dimension. In other words, you come into matter like thought, intelligence coming into matter. And when you get conscious enough and you understand the meaning and you understand the mechanisms, you go back out of matter. Why would you be limited by matter if you had consciousness that was cosmic? So that's what they need to change. They need to change around. The first dimension for them, the first thing they should look at is the pixel. And it will lead them to the true nature of the eight-dimensional crystal. Second thing they need to look at is loops, what they call causality loops, what we call continuums. All consciousness is born upon the surface of spheres, including your memory of your human body. I'm not going to go into that, but that's the truth. And that's been demonstrated by science as well as the ancients. And what do loops and continuums turn into? Of course, they turn into golden ratios in this uh, real fourth dimension. So the golden ratio is a geometric manifestation in time in the fourth dimension that is rhythmic and found in everything that grows that's alive, you will find the golden ratio. If it's alive and it's growing somewhere, whether it's in frequency, geometry, or enzymes. Oh, I wish I could go into enzymes because they're miraculous. By the way, they are run by a form. One little teensy tiny form causes an enzyme never to die. And every other enzyme like it that it meets, it can create one trillion reactions in one second. That's what a form can do in the universe. And then in the video, if they would have understood that non-determinatives lead to information, because there's all information does is confuse you. You have to have meaning. So the fact that the observer must be there mm -hmm. to understand information, you have to have an observer, and that's the fourth dimensional quasi-realm. In other words, where nothing's really sure. You can be, take anything and make it into anything. It's in a state what we call chemical ether. And then, of course, the three dimension is what they call consciousness. And then they do talk about meaning, but what they need to understand is that humans become much more than a human. So what is it that they want to call a being that has these three other dimensions to them? They need to have a name for that human being because they say that the, those three aspects of the human being come rushing into us in the present. We have names for them in the book, and we'll teach you that. We won't go into it now. But basically what we're saying here is this is a fairly good theory that started off with what we had pointed out was Spencer Brown's book, The um, Laws of Form. If you read that and understand it, you'll understand the three-dimensional world is a geometry. And so when people have all their psychedelic experiences, what's the first thing they see? Tons of geometry, right? Geometric fractals. Everybody does. Anybody who has a really clear ayahuasca experience that they describe, you know, I don't know, but that's what they describe. Acid, all this stuff. They all describe what? Many geometric figures all moving at once because, hello, that's the way the three dimension works. All these planes, all these three dimensional uh, ge geometric shapes are rushing into us. For instance, each of your organs has a geometric shape. And Newton's dream was to be able to find that the planets had a platonic solid that related to them so that he could have a geometric mathematical relationship between the planets and music and everything. It would be a theory of everything. It's called Newton's dream. And that's what we gave you in this book called The Ethers is using the ancient wisdom all the way up into the modern time with modern theories to show you that the human being is in fact a seven dimensional being that is going back to the place where it was created from. Now, um, 
I know that you could run for hours on this material, so what I'm going to recommend is that folks uh, take a little dive into the book, listen to the other video you are referencing, and if you would like to hear more, of, if you'd like us to take the chapters of the book and start breaking them down for you with audios, let us know in the comment box. Uh, we're here to help you. Oh, you've got a note for me? Oh, I can't see it. The book is free. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, I've, I've mentioned that before. We All of our materials we offer to you uh, lovingly, and they're free. Of course, if you want to buy a printed book, that's available too. Okay, so we'll see you next time, and we'll be waiting for the reader comments to see which direction we'll go.